Tori Peters has an MFA from the University of Iowa and a master's in comparative literature from Dartmouth University. Peters rides a pink, pink motorcycle, and I found it today that it is a Kawasaki K KLR650 single cylinder thumper. I hope that was right. And uh, Peters splits her time between Brooklyn and an off grid cabin in Vermont. She is the author of novellas Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Masker. Tori's Detransition Baby uh, was published by Random House in January of this year, was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction, and will be the topic of tonight's conversation. Thank you so much, Tori, for being with us virtually from Brooklyn uh, tonight at Evenings with an Author. Thank you so much for having me. Um, that motorcycle sadly was stolen. So I have a new pink motorcycle, uh, but you know, uh, that's the hazards of having a motorcycle in Brooklyn. You just kind of lose them every couple of years. <laughs> but is it, is, it, were, is, it, is it a Kazawaki KLR 650? It wasn't, but you said that very, with like a, a lot of authority, so. <laughs> With no authority, yeah. I, I don't even have yeah. a driver's license, so yeah. let alone a, a cycling license. Um, okay, we have so much to talk about, so I want to get started. Um, first of all, uh, for those who haven't read the book, uh, so I've, I've read it this weekend, I was kind of rereading it yesterday and today. If uh, This is a big task, but what briefly, uh, Tori, is Detransition Baby about? Okay, Detransition Baby is about Reese who is you can think of a sort of like flea bag but trans and in brooklyn in that she's a bit of a mess sleeping with married men trying to figure things out and the action kicks off when her ex ames who used to be a trans woman named amy but detransitioned gets his boss katrina pregnant and then approaches reese to see if they want to if she wants to raise the baby um, with together in, in a sort of unconventional family, a triad. And that's actually only like the first chapter. And then the book is the, you know, how does it go from there is sort of what, what, what the book is about. Um, yeah, that's my, that's my elevator pitch. That is, uh, yeah, I, I, that's a great one. Um, how did you come up with this topic? this specific uh, combination of characters and, and plot? Well, I was, um, I was in my mid, I was in my mid thirties in, in living in Brooklyn, very similar situation to, to Reese. And um, I was kind of, kind of trying to figure out like, okay, I'm on the far side of transition. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the rest of my life. And, and the real question for me is like, how do I live? what 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 do I do to and I looked at the women around me especially the cis women and you know they were having kids or they're having careers and um and that's sort of like how people were making meaning but I was like well what is what would that be for me as a trans woman and you know the thing that seemed the the hardest the most difficult to accomplish was motherhood or family in a certain way so I was like, I'm just gonna go straight at it. And then um, one of the things that I think is, is, is very, very difficult is the question of where does, where does a, if, you're, if you decide that you wanna do like a sort of domestic novel about family and about raising children and about relationships, the question for trans women is where do we fit in that novel and where does the baby come from? And so um, I, kind of was just like this, I need a situation that does that work, but that has a very um, recognizable kind of conflict um, where if if one person gets what they want, the other person doesn't in a sort of classic um, protagonist, antagonist sort of mode where there's a baby and one person wants to be the mother or the other person wants to be the mother, you know, and it goes back to King Solomon, that particular uh, problem. So once I was like, I can give that problem to a trans woman, and then I can see how that looks in sort of a, in this century, in this moment uh, for domestic fiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you described, I guess, the kind of 
the novel of motherhood, the novel of the family. And it seems to me that kind of throughout my research, uh, reading interviews that you've given and, and reviews of the <clears> book, that there was this kind of tension between this is hailed as kind of a trans novel, uh, a new entry to the trans, can ca trans canon on the one hand, uh, and then on the other kind of, as you described, like a family novel, an, a novel about motherhood, a comedy of manners, a novel of bourgeois realism. Um, another way of putting it, and I think you describe this quite nicely, is some people might think of this going into it, that this is a novel you're going to be reading for education about the trans experience. And actually, um, you have argued uh, against approaching literature as a kind of homework, um, as a yeah. kind of educational experience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think what happens is, is people read something trans and they think, number one, that it's new, you know, or that you have to have a whole new form to contain the trans experience. And, and number two, that the reason that they're reading it is to sort of educate themselves. And I think that um, that's not a particularly productive way of approaching literature. You know, I, I think that, that um, why people read literature is and so you walk away you know, walk away and say, well, I, I learned a few things. You, you read literature because you wanna sort of experience what these characters have experienced. You want a sort of enrichment of, of your own life and the way that empathy sort of bounces back. Like there's something kind of, I, I don't mean to sound mystical, but I, I really believe in like the sort of ways that fiction can be expanding in many directions beyond just sort of like, now I know the proper etiquette for addressing a trans person. Like you could get that in a sentence. And then, you know, I think about this in terms of books that are sort of anti-racist reading lists too. You have, you know, uh, sort of, well, read Toni Morrison for this sort of shallow uh, way of doing this. And I think that does a disservice to, to someone like Toni Morrison. But um, so that that's sort of my, my thing about education. But one thing I, I really feel strongly about is that actually, the trans experience fits in with already existing genres. Like you don't actually have to invent a new genre to talk about a trans woman's experience. That trans women, um, you know, the books that I grew up reading were, were women's books, a lot of them, or they were, you know, domestic fiction. I'm, I'm American, so, you know, John Updike or all those people writing about family, that was my tradition. And so it was like, well, there's no reason why I can't actually make a trans iteration in a, in a pre-existing genre. So instead of saying, oh, this is a brand new thing, or it's trans on the one hand, or it's domestic fiction on the other hand, I say that there's a tradition of, you know, a certain type of women's literature, um, writing about sort of domestic family arrangements, and that instead of saying, I'm going to invent something new, I'm going to say, well, I'm going to put a trans iteration on this experience, the same way that that entire history and lineage is a series of iterations of people with their particular concerns iterating uh, the, the stories as they want. So, so for me, um, I was like, I'll do a trans iteration. And in fact, we don't have to sort of reinvent the wheel here that this, is, this, has, this resonates with the existing themes of, of that tradition. And, um, and, it's, and it becomes a not either or in terms of readership. I don't think it has to be like, you're either trans and you know the trans codes to read this book, or you're you know, looking for a Jane Austen novel. Like it can, do, it can do multiple things at once when you position trans work in, as iterations of these, of these traditions. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Toni Morrison and then you mentioned just now trans codes. And you've been very explicit about this story that your approach uh, for this novel has been writing for trans women. And you actually said that you looked to Morrison who herself said that she writes or wrote explicitly for other black women. And that I think this is a quote, everyone else can keep up. Yeah. And you had said previously that this was not the case for trans writing. And previously something like this, again, this is kind of, these are your words, but 70% of the story was about story. And then 30% was slowing down to kind of accommodate, let's say a lay audience. And right. you had said, you know what, F it, <laughs> I'm going to write for trans women. And then you described writing a flat out run at full speed. And you said that it made you a better writer. Can you talk about yeah. that? So <clears throat> what happened is I started writing and, um, and, and especially because I think the emphasis for trans writing was a sort of edu educational 
type of writing where you were sort of said, told like, oh, you should explain the trans experience to the reader. And you know, you should explain the language. You could, should explain all these, these different things. And so you had these books that, that did exactly as you say, where you had a story, but, but the story was constantly stuttering to be like, oh, here's what this word means. Oh, here's what this concept is. Oh, here's this. And, and other writers from other um, backgrounds don't break up their story every, every 30 pages to be like, here's a little bit that you know. They assume that their readers are smart, that their readers you know, in this day and age have access to Google, and if you want to, you know, if you want to read a story, you build the momentum of the story and you go. So I, I began to sort of assume, assume, first of all, that readers are smart. And then secondly, that the vibe that you get when you're writing for other people who get it, like other people who are going to get it all the time, means that it is a way of thinking where you're not slowing down and that it challenges you. So for instance, if I was to write, um, if I write about hormones and I'm envisioning a trans readership, um, I and I just if I just say like here's a here's a thing about hormones that most people who aren't on hormones think is interesting, uh, those trans, uh, all those other trans people will will kind of yawn at me. They'll be like, yeah, I do hormones every week. You're telling me something boring, which means that that actually raises the bar for me as a writer that if I'm envisioning a trans readership and I'm like, they're gonna be bored with the basic level of insight. So I have to bring some insight that other trans people themselves wouldn't have, not the general public, but trans people themselves. It forces me to be a much better writer. It forces me to dig deeper into like the trans conversations to say something new to trans people. But because I think that other readers uh, who aren't trans uh, can keep up, that means that they also get the deeper insights. They're not, you know, sort of skating along the surface. So by imagining a trans audience, it makes the work better for all sorts of different readers. Is, is, and that, that's, that's an approach that I, that I learned reading about how, you know, um, the Black writers in, in America began writing, um, you know, and for each other. And the idea that they weren't going to slow down their stories, and from those authors who were who were writing at a flat out run, we got some of the great American books from people who weren't slowing down. So I was like, I'll do that for a trans approach. Yeah, I uh, have many things to say, but I just wanted to kind yeah. of go back to the genesis of this book because it seems to me been you've been writing at kind of flat out pace for a while, but it's only recently that you. That there's been space maybe in the kind of <clears throat> market for, for this novel. So you, um, the kind of novellas that I described in the introduction, they were self-published because at the time there was kind of discussion that maybe the publishing industry doesn't serve um, trans women. What's changed no. now? What's the response been like from kind of, you know, the general public and what's the response been like from the trans community itself? Well, so I moved to Brooklyn in to be part of this trans writing scene. There was, um, in around 2012, 2013, there was a series of, of mostly trans women <clears throat> from around the country and including Canada who all moved to Brooklyn. And they literally were writing for each other in the way that like the trans women are, are audience, they, they, they're like, we're gonna write these stories for each other. And when they gave them to the, to the publishers, the publishers were like, wait, I'm not sure that the audiences can keep up. Like we do actually want these um, stories that are a bit slower, that explain everything. And so, um, and I, I arrived on that scene and we were sort of like, well, we don't actually want to slow down and we care about each other's work. So we're going to write for each other. And what happened is that that approach that we developed seven, eight years ago, I think the world ended up catching up with us that we were, that what happened is you had um, a, a bunch of different media that were, uh, you know, things like Transparent, things like uh, Orange is the New Black, uh, even Pose, Condé Nast, you know, the biggest magazine publisher uh, opened up a queer vertical. And when those people were like, well, what does trans storytelling mean? How do you tell a trans story? Where are the new trans stories coming from? 
this scene in Brooklyn that I was part of became, uh, you know, people pointed it out. So there was a way in which um, what ended up happening, I think, is that um, interest and, and the world kind of caught up with us. Uh, so it wasn't that that much that we changed. It was that uh, it was that we've been doing the same thing for eight, nine years, but suddenly there was an opportunity in the market for what we've been doing. I will say that's and that's especially true for for many of the other women we're publishing. I will say that I did change a little bit in in my approach with this book, which is that the two novellas that you mentioned are really uncompromising. They were early on for me, and I was like, I'm going to write for a trans audience, and I'm just going to jump in the deep end. And what ended up happening is that I think my idea of writing in a sort of like identity bounded space, like trans as an identity, what I discovered is that like that identity is huge. And there's all sorts of people who are trans. You know, we're not monolithic. There are a lot of trans people who disagree with me, who disagree with my approach, disagree with the things that I write, don't particularly like my work. Uh, and that's fine. You know, not all trans people have to agree. Um, but what I just, so having published these two, self-published these two books, they became sort of cult novellas. And I had all these conversations with other trans women. And, in, and when I started Detransition Baby, I began to think less in terms of a sort of identity bounded uh, kind of writing or an identity bounded uh, audience and more an affinity uh, bounded audience where I'm like, there's a bunch of trans women that I have affinity with. I'm going to write for these trans women that I have affinity with. And then as I was reading lots of books, largely by cis women, by cis divorced women, I began to feel that, oh, I have an affinity with, with lots of cis women too. And so I can kind of pick my readership as a sort of Venn diagram that, of, uh, of the trans women with whom I have affinity and the cis women with whom I have affinity. And I, I broadly named the cis women with whom I have affinity um, divorced cis women. And it's because I was reading Elena Ferrante, I was reading Rachel Kosk, I was reading these different writers who were writing a lot about divorce in their 30s. And I began to see that the narrative of divorce looks a lot like the narrative of transition in that you live your life a certain way, believing certain things. And then there's a moment that's like a break or in some ways a failure uh, that's divorce or transition. And your life suddenly looks different and you have to start over without getting bitter and without reinvesting in the illusions that brought you to that failure in the first place. And so the questions that I found in Ferrante or the questions I found in Kosk had this incredible resonance with the questions that trans women were asking themselves. And so I began to think less in sort of like, okay, I'm gonna write specifically for trans women so much as I'm gonna write for the experience of largely women who've had this kind of break and you've had to start over in a certain way. And that there's, there's an affinity there that I can kind of find and I can kind of cobble together a readership in this, in this way that isn't captured by a lot of demographics, um, especially not necessarily identity no. demographics. Yeah. Um, and that, that kind of became my, my, my guiding way of seeing things. And I think still, you know, to talk about an affinity-based readership, that sounds like nonsense if I'm doing just, you know, uh, sound bites and publicity, but it actually is closer to how I think about my readership as opposed to purely trans women. There are imp important thinkers and important people in my life who are not trans and who, are, who, who, but whose work and thoughts are as vital to me as those trans women. Um, and I think that that, you know, especially as I, as I, as there are more and more trans stories and those trans stories are more and more discordant, I'm not gonna to speak to all trans people. I'm going to speak to a slice of them that I think continues on into other groups of people as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. And it's, it's a lovely moment in the novel where, you know, you mentioned the kind of three main characters at the beginning and let's, let's return to the plot now because it's yeah. so rich and there's so much to talk about, but, there's a lovely moment where uh, Reese, so the kind of ex 
uh, of Amy, yeah. Amy and Katrina, they, they find affinity precisely because Katrina is herself divorced. Yeah. Mm. And I, to me, it, it's not just only divorce that Reese and Katrina find. I think it has to do with their relationship to a sort of center that they share this, that, and by that, I mean, you know, Katrina's half Asian, but white passing. Uh, Reese is cis passing. She passes as a cis woman. And so Reese sort of has this idea that like, if only I could be a cis white woman with a husband, everything would be okay. And Katrina has a similar relationship with the idea of like cis white woman. She's almost, she passes as that, uh, but she's, her actual experience is just outside of it. And so one of the things I was trying to create with these particular characters is the ways that their experiences resonate in relationship to a sort of idea of a centered, um, you know, a centered identity or something. Um, and that they find these resonances across these different levels that in some ways, uh, you know, I think you're not supposed to find resonances. Like there's a bit of a stay in your lane sort of thing and you can't compare race and gender, you can't do these things. And yet the ways that I think that I, that I, that I actually relate to people is I'm constantly finding resonance, resonances with people across difference and that fiction is a place where you can experience those resonances without having to perfectly theorize them. Yeah, I think that's right. And there was a lovely, um quote, uh, I, re I read a kind of review by, I think your friend and colleague, Karen Walker. Yeah. Uh, we'll talk about um, yeah. her later on, but she says that Peter's debut novel is not the polemic that all the eagerly sensationist readings out there would have you believe. It's a book about relationships, why we form them, why we end them. There's nothing inherently trans about this experience. I think that's, it is, a, it's a book about relationships. And I think, so there's the relationship to this kind of centered identity that you mentioned. There's also the relationship to the nuclear family and to parenthood. And something that I was really kind of also moved by was Reese's, I'm sorry, rather Ames's relationship, well, I guess I suppose Reese's relationship to yeah. motherhood, which you described at the beginning, kind of born out of your own feelings towards this kind of time in your life that you didn't call then, but you have called the sex in the city. Yeah. <laughs> problem which I love <laughs> I think you should copyright that <laughs> um, but uh, there's also Ames's uh, so Ames uh, who transitioned to be Amy and then detransitioned back to Ames and is now with Katrina who also happens to be not only half Asian but also his boss so there are yeah. just you really didn't kind of make life easy for yourself <laughs> to <worry> with all <laughs> the different power dynamics and race dynamics and uh, gender dynamics anyway so He's now with Katrina, uh, she's pregnant, and he feels, I mean, his, this kind of the imminence, the arrival of the baby uh, brings up all these feelings in him about parenthood and specifically fatherhood. And there's a great line kind of early on where Ames says to Katrina, I don't know if I can be a father, but like, I can be a parent. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean to you? I mean, I think, I think, there's, you know, fatherhood is an interesting thing because it's, it's motherhood, I think, in this book is, is very well sketched out. Motherhood, uh, there's a series of different sort of ways in which it's talked about biological motherhood. Um, there's a, a culture of trans motherhood amongst trans women where, you know, younger, just out trans women will go to older trans women to learn how to live. That kind of motherhood is sketched out. And then, um, you know, there's sort of just like maternal relationships and hierarchies throughout the book. Fatherhood's a little bit different because um, fatherhood, I think in this is, is a negative experience in the way it's portrayed, not in life itself, but that Ames experiences fatherhood as a sort of gender role. Like that, that, that one of the things that the book talks about, and I think this is a trans idea is divorcing um, <clears throat> gender roles from sort of male and female, that there's, that, that, that you know, um, that we do gender and we do various genders. And, you know, so in, in a very simple way, um, you know, there's many different ways to be a man. You can be, and, and 
a, a sort of generic one would might be like, oh, you're a, you're a woodsman, right? And that like being a woodsman is a gender that, and that that gender of woodsman is very different than like white collar office worker or something. Yeah. And that that actually our world is is full of these various genders, you know? And what happens I think for Ames is that parent in that, and he, and I think Ames is dis dissociated, so he has a hard time talking about it, but that parent is a function, you know, and that father in some ways is a gender for Ames. The father is the one who has the baseball mitt and who tells you, you know, good job, son, get out there or something like that. And what Ames is, is reacting to is the expectations that adhere to a gender role rather than to a function. Ames is also unable to sort of articulate this because I think we don't have good ways of articulating the difference between father as a gender role and father as a function, that we just have the word father. And, um, and, and now, you know, five years after I wrote this book, I can say there's a big difference between a gender role Father, father as a as a gender role, the one with the baseball mitt, and father as the person who has a sort of function in raising a child. That function for Ames is named parent. This is a very like kind of wonky answer to this, but uh, I spent a long a, a long time basically being like, why why is Ames so resistant to this? Does this distinction matter? Is this just Ames using words to avoid? Um, reality, avoid his re responsibility. Um, and I think it's both. I think that Ames is an, an avoidant person, but I think also Ames is troubled by being unable to have the language to discern those two things. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And um, I mean, that's what's so wonderful about your characters is that uh, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, the kind of flea bag analogy, but uh, they're messy, you said, and, yeah. and, and they're, they're complicated and there's no kind of moral high ground, you know, it's not as if one character is kind of speaking the gospel truth and everyone else is, is listening to it and, and feeling inferior. There is so much kind of, there is so much change and, and the characters themselves change and grow and develop. And um, so that I think is, is, is highly positive. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I want to go back to this idea of fatherhood because I wonder, um, you mentioned that, that kind of being able to uncouple uh, fatherhood as a kind of act and fatherhood uh, related to gender. And I, I imagine you're kind of using Judith Butler here in, in, the, back, in the background or other kind of... Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, um, Judith Butler, you know, if you... Judith Butler is interesting because there's Judith Butler in what she actually talks about, which is like, you know, the performativity of language and like, et cetera, et cetera, and speech acts, uh, speech act theory. And then there's Judith Butler as, as she's sort of understood in a vulgar sense that we perform roles, which I don't think Judith Butler herself actually said, but has, we've come to sort of use Judith Butler's name uh, probably against her will as a shorthand for these kinds of performances. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think Judith Butler and some others have been sort of assimilated into what I call a trans lens, mm. uh, a trans lens on things. And I, and I think that that's actually something that people uh, are interested in this book is the way that actually that a trans way of seeing gender as for instance, like that, you know, there's, there's memes on Twitters where, where it'll be like, the meme is like the two genders. And I don't know, it'll be like, a plant and a book or something like that. And, and the joke being that there's, there's not two genders, there's many different genders that are all interacting with each other this way. And that this is a sort of trans insight that you transition, okay, and you've transitioned genders, but now you actually have to be a gender within your genders or, or you have to combine genders to find these gender roles that, that work for you, you know, broadly. Uh, you know, queers have been doing this for a long time. They've been using words like high femme or low femme or hard femme or like, you know, these are all names of different ways of being one's gender. Uh, and you can, so when I say woodsman or like a lumberjack or something like that, you know, that's, be, that's doing a gender. I always talk about on Tinder profiles that men have pictures of fish in their Tinder profiles. And it's like, 
that's you're doing a gender you know like if you have a picture where you're on a dating site and you're holding a fish what you're saying is like look i'm a provider i will i'll slap some food on the table for you that's the kind of gender i'm doing and you know the trans lens names that that's you're doing a gender in your tinder profile and and it unpacks the kind of the work of what you're saying because literally nobody wants you to show up on the first day with a fish that's that's not a good way of advertising yourself uh, as, a, as a potential date but you are saying something you're doing a gender and and that idea of trans lens helps to see the various ways you can do gender and i think that a lot of cis people straight people um you know I, they are beginning to see that the trans way of, of of using language is not unique to only the trans circumstance it's that trans people have had to develop this language to name what we're doing and this language is quite useful for every all of us because we all have genders we all are doing genders all the time and um and if you just say that your gender is a man, well, you're missing a lot of the nuances and you're missing a lot of ways of ana analyzing yourself. And, and this is also true, I think, in fatherhood, you know, which is a very loaded type of, of, of gender performance where you say, well, this is what it means to be a father. Well, no, th that's a father in that way is often doing a gender and you can unpack it and see that maybe this piece is necessary, this piece isn't necessary. And, you know, I'm a big fan of, of of the kinds of different genders that men have. I think that men are quite interesting and fascinating in the ways that they perform genders. I just think that there's a language for describing them that is oftentimes antithetical to the performance of those genders mm, yeah. or, or rejected by, the, by those genders, let me just say. Right, right, yeah. And I think, Be um, I think this idea of language is really interesting and in kind of looking to a trans language to understand how we might better understand our own yeah. Kind of, you know, um, central society or nuclear family, the breakdown of nuclear family, you know, um, it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, imminence of, of that. Um, I wonder uh, if you could speak a little bit um, about, I suppose, more kind of about, we had mentioned fatherhood and then also you had mentioned motherhood, that there is motherhood to be found within the kind of uh, trans female community and that was another kind of piece of the novel that I think I imagine maybe was born out of kind of writing uh, to a trans audience and that was was very very moving and also highlights all of the different ways that one can be a mother one can be a father and to add on to that Tori I wonder when do you find yourself kind of performing different genders now I mean I imagine mm. you're more sensitive to it but how does it show up yeah I mean it's it is funny um it's funny what you say about you know the dissolution of nuclear family and stuff because I think it's on one hand it's true but on the other hand there's a way in which this sort of sensitivity sensitivity of language preserves it because you instead of it being a default it can be intentional and you can say this is how I want my family to look this is how and I think that that's actually something that you're finding I mean in in trans community so I know a number of of trans people um, who are especially trans women who date trans men and the sort of world that this book describes has in some ways come true where, where many of my friends, trans women and trans men are going off of hormones and they're getting pregnant. And so the trans man is the one who carries the child. And then after the pregnancy is over, they, they go on hormones again and they have their gender roles of father and mother um, and what they're doing is they're intentionally recreating a nuclear family together, you know, but they're doing it in a way where they're naming what they're doing. And they're saying, at this point, I'm going to be the father, at, you know, I, where they're always a the father, but like, this is the role that I'm going to, I'm going to decouple carrying a child from motherhood, the biological function of it. And I'm going to assign that to me as a father while I'm pregnant. And, you know, all of these things they're, they're taking apart. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all going to go away. I mean, this is actually something that I that I, I I think is a misconception that that if you if you follow the sort of trans ideas to their logical conclusion, gender is over. 
if anything, trans people have offered a language to to reinforce, not reinforce, but to to name the variety and 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 vastness of the differences of gender. Um, and so there's a way in which, for me, th this stuff. Uh, I, I mean. I happen to just pick on this little thing that you said, and I, 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 but I find it very important for the way that I that I write and the way that I think about this writing. Um, and now let me try and answer your actual question. No, can I, I just I just wanted because I actually wanted to I wanted to kind of go to dig into <clears throat> that more because what I'm really curious, you know, uh, this tr this trans language, uh, the lens through which to look at the world. Why do you think it's such an affront to so many people's worldviews? And I'm thinking, I want to move on now to the kind of European uh, angle yeah. of this conversation because I had read about the reception of your book specifically in the UK. Yeah. And you, this is a kind of your. I'm kind of quoting you here, but you said, when I published my book, all these UK people said a book like this couldn't have been written in the UK because of the ways I centered myself and the liberties I took to think that trans people were just kind of every day. I had the freedom to imagine trans people as quotidien, which what, boring, <laughs> flawed people. I wasn't engaging with trans people as an embattle, embattled group. And then you said kind of at the end, I'm going to have to work hard to recapture the imaginative, imaginative space that I worked in because it has been impinged upon by the UK's response to this book. So I suppose affront generally, and why why in a British affront? Do you think? Well, um, you know, I think that there's. I'll just say I'm going to say something really fast to go back a little bit to try and explain where I come from. I think that I'll try and do this very briefly. But that in in the development of marginalized literature, there's a a, a sort of movements that it moves through. This is Joanna Russ's idea that. At first, the marginalized group speaking to the dominant culture says, we're just like you, you know, uh, we're no threat at all to you. And then the second is actually, we're nothing like you. Uh, we reject you all to, altogether. And this is sort of like the punk, you know, uh, movement away from the dominant culture. And then there's a third level, which it says like, actually we have nothing to do with you one way or another. We're not, we don't define ourselves either against you or, or with you. But then I think there's a fourth level. And this is not Joanna Ross. This is my, my formulation. This is me. <laughs> yeah, this is me. <laughs> which is that the fourth level is that the dominant culture comes to take on the ideas of the marginalized culture. So you have, uh, I mean, it's not my idea, but in this formulation, it's mine. So the, you know, straight people come to understand their sexuality through the terms and ideas developed by homosexuality. You know, even the word heterosexuality is, we have that word because homosexuality came first. How do you, what's the opposite of homosexuality? And thus heterosexuality as a concept came into being. We understand whiteness oftentimes through terms and ideas that have been you know, invented by or thought up by thinkers of color. And now there's ways of looking at gender that cis, the cis mainstream have come to understand their gender or coming, I think are coming to understand their gender through trans ideas and terms. So the trans idea is now kind of moving into the mainstream. The mainstream is picking it up. And I think this is very, very threatening. You know, it's one thing for trans people to be off on their own doing their own like little thing. It's another for suddenly cis people to have to reassess their own uh, ways of thinking. I mean, you have this in the United States with, with race where, where, where critical race theory is very, very threatening to a lot of people because suddenly white people have to understand their own whiteness through, through, through these other terms that, that aren't the terms they're used to thinking of. So there is a kind of way in which trans ideas have now become uh, a way that a lot of people think of their own gender. And <clears throat> in the UK, uh, as, I, as I, I've not been there, so this is me just completely talking about it as I experienced it over the internet. Um, you know, there's there's a kind of two modes. There's there's the actual ideas of of oftentimes feminists, where all of these philosophical ideas about what it means to be a woman, how one is a woman, and how one defends the position of being a woman by the left, by feminists, 
they feel that those gains are slipping away uh, due to due to this new these new ideas in which the category of woman has a sort of fuzziness at the edges. That's very threatening to uh, feminist thinkers. And so you have a fear on the left of trans people, and then you have fear stoked on the right from uh, you know, people who think that trans women are going to run into bathrooms or whatever that, you know, that happens to be. And those two things are sort of sort of merging into a moral panic. Uh, and and when I when I experience what happens, the response in the UK, what I experienced was a kind of this, it's like this, I recognize this from history as this is a moral panic. And um and I think it's it's very difficult you know, there's not that same moral, there are moral panics all, all the time in the United States. That particular moral panic is not what I'm experiencing. And so I don't think about it. I go outside my house and I don't really think about being trans. I don't really care. I don't really worry about it too much. I think my friends are just average people, oftentimes very boring people, often wrong. I'm often wrong. And so then we write our boring little lives because we're not at the center, we're not the subjects of a moral panic. And then I go to UK and my book gets published and, and now I am the subject in a moral panic. And if I want to return to writing my boring little life, I have to remember that that moral panic, it's not real, it is just a panic. And if I, you know, and I also have to remember that I'm not particularly interesting, <laughs> you know, that I'm not, a, I'm not the subject that's going to uh, shake society to its foundations or whatever, like I'm a writer. You know, I'm a novelist, and and um, and uh, so so that's and that's I think the thing that was like both shocking to the trans people in the UK was like you wrote this as though you are not at the center of a moral panic. We don't know what it's like to write in that world, and also it opened it up so that now I think that the the UK writers, I'm reading UK writers who are rejecting the moral panic and are writing as, you know, quotidian people, as quotidian. <laughs> uh, uh, the quotidian people that they are. Yeah, just briefly, and then we have a great question uh, from Elena in the chat, but can you speak about the intersection, and then we'll also hopefully talk about France, I think we have time, um, but the intersection of moral panic with with the internet and social media? And why, yeah. is this, why is this such a kind of virulent intersection, do you think? I mean, I think there's a lot of social panics. Uh, I, and I think that, you know, and-, and Cause you, you, know, use, one thing, you use social media. I mean, you yourself are- I do. Media, but then you sometimes retreat to Vermont, which I imagine is maybe as a way to yeah. escape, maybe social My, media. I'm actually moving away from social media because I, I you know, it was one thing to do it, um, where I really knew that it was a, a, a certain section of readership, but now I find that the the time frame of a, of a of a tweet is not conducive to thinking on the on the time frame of a novel. Like when I tweet, um, that has a shelf life of twenty four hours, maybe, and a novel has a uh, you has to have a shelf life of years. And so I'm finding actually that. The problem isn't so much moral panics. The problem is time frames uh, that I that I'm I need to switch time frames, uh, and I'm getting away from social media for that reason. But you know, I think that actually that is time frame is is related to the moral panics in that it it feels so all encompassing when you're when you're in like a viral storm. It feels like it's the entire world that it's all very threatening, and. Um, and I think that uh, you have these, I mean, there, you could go on about social media for a long time, but, but I think it is the time frame and the all encompassingness of it uh, does lend itself to a kind of moral, moral panic. And I, and I think on all sides, I think trans people, we have our own, they don't get out as much, but we have our own versions of moral panics that are social media stooped, stoked. Mm -hmm. Okay, lovely. And we're going to get to the France and, and the question of, of, of French, because as, as we kind of were talking about before, you speak French and Spanish, and weirdly, what? you were saying <laughs> a, a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's been like 20 years. I lived in Cameroon for a while, so yeah. Um, 
And, and you were saying that out of the 11, I think 11 European languages uh, into which the transition baby is being translated, strangely, uh, French and then Spain, Spanish are the only. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was like as though they knew that those are the two that I'd be able to read. And they were like, we're not going to, we'll have no fact checking here. So, and it is, uh, it's in uh, all the Nordic languages except for Norwegian, which makes sense because I made fun of Norway in the book with the Sebastian character. And so they were like, we're not allowing that book in our language. But it's in Dutch, uh, it's in, in Turkish. Oh, um, wow. Oh, that's yeah. Uh, in, uh, German, Italian. Mm -hmm. Danish, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm excited to get in the first, the, the, Braz the Brazilian Portuguese is the first, I think, to come out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, let's get to these questions because they're lovely. So Milena writes, I have a question for Tori, exclamation point. <laughs> yeah. I'm from Mexico and there's just no literature by trans people in general in the whole language. So I began reading Tori and it resonated so vividly. What does it mean to you to be at the forefront of visibility literally everywhere? Also wanted to thank Tori for writing universal topics about universal topics like hope, fear, and confusion, because there's nothing trans there and it's easy to relate. Well, so this is what's interesting is that I actually think that there are very good trans writers uh, in um, writing in Spanish and writing in Latin America. The problem is why aren't those books known? So there's, I, I'm not gonna, I don't remember everyone's name offhand, but. Um, there's a Mexican, there was a, a, a Mexican woman who was writing in the 90s and, and her books were translated by uh, Jackie S and by um, an American trans woman, uh, I'm blanking on her name. And they were given, so when we were in Brooklyn, we got translated copies of these Latin American books. There was an Argentinian trans woman uh, that, that was uh, pretty well known. And and so the question is, why do, you, why do these books get translated, then come to English, and then, but you can't find them in, in, uh, in Latin America? So I don't think it's that, um, that we're on the forefront of these ideas. I think that, that Latin Americans have their own ideas and their own, uh, their own histories and, and, and their own iterations, the trans people are making their own iterations in these Latin American countries. I think it has to do with something about the circulation and the distribution of, of, of who gets their work uh, picked up. You know, I live in New York and which means that, you know, I can look out the window and not quite, but almost, you know, maybe if I went to my roof, I could see Penguin Random House's building. Penguin Random House has uh, presses in, in all these different countries and all these different languages. So when Pen Penguin Random House is looking, they reach out their door and they find me. It doesn't necessarily mean that I think my ideas are, are, are further along than in the rest of the world. And I think that, you know, what is needed for me is to find those other ideas and bring them along with me. Like that's my job. Uh, that's my job as as a trans writer is to not be the only voice. And if I am the only voice, there's too much pressure on me. My jokes don't land because they're not targeted. They're speaking on behalf of all these trans people. So, you know, it's my job to know that there, and I, I apologize that I don't have their names offhand, but it's my job to know that there's a Mexican, a uh, famous Mexican trans writer. It's my job to know that there's an Archenian trans writer. It's my job to know that, you know, there's there's the, the, the writing in Spanish of, um, La Veneno, that turned into the TV show La Veneno, that was a memoir uh, of, of La Veneno's uh, that was picked up by a journalist and done. And, and so that this, there's a cacophony of voices rather than only my own, um, because if it is just mine, uh, it'll make me a bad artist to have to speak on behalf of all these people whose experiences are so different than my own. Right, right. You mentioned humor. I just wanted to get this line in there because it, it really, it, I think it's kind of been passed around a little bit on the internet, but truly when you read it in, in the context of the novel, it is so funny. So um, you write, many people think a trans woman's deepest desire is to live in her true gender, but actually it is always stand in good lighting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So that's a, that joke is, 
that joke is funny for Brooklyn trans girls, right? Well, like the Brooklyn trans girls are just constantly walking around looking for good lighting, which is true. You can see them at the bar constantly like angling themselves to the good lighting. I mean, I'm sure I in instinctively do it, but um, that joke is less funny uh, yeah. if you, if you, you know, are talking to someone who's just immigrated and is, is fleeing sexual violence or something, you know? Uh, and so, uh, those resonances, I think, of, of who you're speaking for and who, how it's happening are, are part of the humor and, and knowing it and, and being aware of the different traditions. I mean, I, I'm looking forward to going, I hope that at some point I get to go on tour in, in, in especially in, in the continent um, and, you know, talk to talk to what the talk to different readers and 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 maybe bring them on stage with me like what is a dutch what's the experience of a dutch trans woman you know what's the experience of a uh of a turkish trans woman you know and 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 when i first started i'm sorry i'm gonna say this little thing the tour that group that we did that i was part of that trans writing scene we would go on tour and we did this thing where we'd stop in every small town and and there were the those of us who had books but then we'd invite on stage all of the trans girls from the local town so we'd be in texas or or you know washington state or whatever and we go to a small town and we say we're doing a reading any trans woman who wants to get on stage with us and have 10 minutes to read your stuff come on stage and there's a way in which our stories were so richened by, by not being the only voices on the stage and having local voices. And that's not something you see in commercial publishing. You don't go to a bookstore and, and say, I'm gonna sign these books and also anyone else who wants to have their books on display come along. But I think it is a, a, a big piece of my way of seeing the world is informed by having read on stage with trans women of all walks of life. Yeah. Lovely. I'm just gonna. We have got so many questions. I want to get to them. Um, Malavika and and their great ones. Writes. I love the idea of trans women as mundane and boring. By the way, yeah, I, I don't think you are. And this book, and certainly interesting. This book is incredibly interesting. So uh, I reject. I reject that. I reject yeah. that. But Malavika writes. I love the idea of trans people as mundane and boring. But I also felt that detransition baby leaned delightfully into the soap opera drama that is daily existence for a queer person, our internal messy communities, exes, et cetera. How do you, Tori, reconcile these two ideas of normalcy on the one hand and drama on the other? Well, I think that uh, most writing is about what you leave in and what you leave out, you know? So I try to leave out as much of the boring bits as possible and that, you know, what's left over is kind of the, the soap opera qualities. Um, and, and so it's something that's interesting about like sort of like the auto fiction movement is that, you know, in auto fiction, you leave in the boring bits, whereas in a soap opera, you definitely, you, you, you cut them out. And I think I'm closer to, uh, I'm not an auto, I, I admire auto fictionists, but I'm not an auto fictionist because I'm primarily interested in taking, a, taking in some ways boring people and excising all but what is exciting to me about them. Uh, and that's just my approach as a, as a writer. And then oftentimes finding the genre in which those little bits live well. Okay, lovely. I'm just gonna keep going here. So uh, Charlie-Anne R says, there's been a lot of education in media over the past 10 years or so about trans language and the idea of gender versus sexuality. And I feel like your book turn those understood guidelines on its head, I agree. Does media language around trans issues need to expand or is it a matter of individual journalists just taking the time to understand each person's language preferences when a story uh, that involves them, when a story involves them? I mean, I think it's a job of, 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 of a paper like, you know, a, a major newspaper, you know, like the AP should have guidelines about how you address somebody, you know, because every single little story in, an, in a newspaper, if you're covering, you're just reading the wires or whatever, like these stories are not, you don't have time to know people's particular preferences. So it's good to have a sort of uh, some standards. However, you know, a lot of times what's needed is, is a 
is not an etiquette book, but a basic level of respect. You know, I talked to like, you know, some grandmother in the countryside uh, when I'm up in Vermont, and I don't expect her to know all of the most recent nomenclature of, of transness. I expect, I expect her to, to treat me with a basic level of respect. And it's incumbent upon me as like a person in the world to understand the difference between etiquette and respect. If somebody offers me respect, I don't really care what language they use. You can tell when somebody is, is be, speaking to you in a respectful way. Um, and so there's a, there's, people will often ask me like, what should I do with my kids? How should I raise my kids with these pronouns? And I'm oftentimes like, you should raise your kids to be kind. And if your kid is kind and sees a person in the world who looks different or is doing something different and they have a basic kindness in their approach, they're gonna say, they're not gonna be like, I'm gonna charge into the circumstance. They're gonna look at that person. They're gonna say, I'm gonna make some evaluations. And if it makes sense to ask what that person's doing, I'll go ahead and ask respectfully. And that, you know, to, to avoid, to have an, like there's a way in which etiquette, these etiquettes sort of avoid those human interactions. And so somebody can speak to me with the perfect language. They can, they can gender me just right. They can use all the right words and they can be horribly disrespectful. Like, and, and you can tell when that stuff has happened. And I think that, that uh, what I value, what I value is, is, is interactions between people in which maybe it's a little hard, maybe, uh, maybe a feeling got stepped on here and there, but um, but largely you come out enriched. I think that's so well put. And but it seems to me that a lot of people would disagree with you, and they and they they oftentimes conflate lack of etiquette equals lack of respect. I agree, and this is why many trans people don't agree with my way of of seeing things. You know why they wouldn't like this book, or they would find this book to be, um, you know. On one hand, this book is, is um, you know, there's, people will see it as radical. But on the other hand, there's ways in which there's a sort of, uh, I, don't, I don't want to say conservatism for it, but there's a way in, in which I see the way that people interact with each other. And, um, and, I, and I don't think, you know, I don't think that like, like I got accused of being an assimilationist, you know, when I wrote this book, because because it's, it talks about how family can make you happy. And if you're a real radical, you want to abolish the family. Well, I don't necessarily, want, for people who want the family abolished, yes, I would like them to be able to abolish the family. But for people who family, whose family makes them happy, keep on with the family. Uh, and that what's important to me isn't, uh, what is your dogma or your ideology? The important thing for me is, is are you, are you being intentional and conscious in the way that you interact with the world? Uh, and, um, and so in, in the question of etiquette and these sort of things, I think, again, it, it has to do with place and scale. The AP, they're a professional organization that needs to get it right. The Guardian newspaper, wh whatever. These people need to get it right. A, a college institution, you can't have a guest on and, 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 and introduce the guest in an insulting way in front of an audience where the guest could never, you know, turn to the, the, the person who introduced them and say, hey, you, you've insulted me in the way that you've done that. So those people, have, they have, their job is to get it right. But, you know, if I'm on the street and somebody, somebody says something wrong to me, you know, it's... I don't, I'm not so, I'm not so afraid of the world that I can, that I can't turn to them and say, hey, this is how I prefer to be addressed and, and move from there. You know, I, I don't want to hide from the world. And I think that etiquette in, in certain ways, etiquette is a, etiquette is a, is a, is a series of s strict rigid codes so that you don't have to interact with somebody, you know, um, here's the prescribed thing to, here's the prescribed greeting and, and we don't actually have to mean it. Yeah, in some ways the learning of it even, it just becomes almost rote and there's no kind of, yeah. there's no intentionality or emotion behind it. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. Listen, I'm looking at- I, mean, I probably should, I should have said, don't record this while I say that, but you know, it's, that's how I feel. 
Um, I don't, do you have an extra 10 minutes? I, I don't know. Yeah, if, I have a, okay, yeah. I just want to, I really want to get to this question of the French language because I think it's, uh, well, not only the French language, also Spanish, also Romance languages, because you mentioned, you know, it's incumbent upon kind of larger organizations to prepare for the eventualities of, of you know, various different kinds of genders or non-binary, you know, with they or however, however the person wants to be addressed. But this is a challenge, of course, when we move into Romance languages, with Latin, with Latinate origins and Latin origins, um, because of the masculine feminine requirements of the language, it's much harder to kind of collapse the binary. Um, so in French, you can choose to use, there are options, il, il, but then when you, um, uh, need, when you use an adjective, for instance, so like, instead of saying il est content, Oh, elle, est, elle est contente, so you have to add the E to, to indicate that that person is, is right. a woman. And if you don't add the E kind of in protest against the binary, you're, you're saying that they're a man. So there's that challenge. There's also the challenge that Fr French doesn't have a pronoun for they because the third person plural is either il or elle. Um, and there's also the challenge that in groups, uh, so if, if you do have a group of people um, a, you know, a, a kind of third person plural, and let's say they're 55, as soon as they're 51, I'm sure you know this from your, from your yeah. fluency in, in French and Spanish, <laughs> <I'm joking>. um, <laughs> um, but as soon as, as soon as the, the men in the group are predominant, it, it defaults to the, to the, right. to the male plural. I mean, briefly, what, what are your thoughts on this? And then we'll move into the, to the breakout room. So, you know, if you if you read this book, this is a book that people say is challenges a lot of gender norms <clears throat> um, or or certain certain things. There's not a, I think maybe there's one or two they them pronouns in this entire book. So this is a book in which you have a character named you know Ames, whose gender is very con very confusing, very fluid, moves back and forth, and um, is definitely not a sort of like clearly a man or clearly a woman. And yet I didn't use they, them pronouns, which is to say, I think language is more flexible than we give it credit for if you are being creative about how you use it. Um, and I think that trans people are up to the challenge of being creative with language. Um, and so whether or not, you know, and I think this, this even even with they them pronouns, we chose they them pronouns largely because that already exists and was used in the English language for for hundreds of years. People refer to non-gendered uh, pronouns as they. You know, you can find it in you can find it in in Old English. You can find it in Middle English. You can find they them as so. What did trans people do? They found something that was already exist. They didn't. There's this idea that trans people invented a new pronoun with they, them in English. They didn't, they, they found, they had a language that we already, we've been using for hundreds of years and they found the pieces in the language that felt good to them. And I think that, um, and you know, of course, some people, you know, freak out about they, them pronouns and they act like it's a brand new thing, but it's not. Trans people saw a thing that existed, they took it and they used it for themselves. I think that there's something very, Anglo-centric about the idea that the only way to uh, speak to the trans experience is to do in French what English speakers have done. I think French people are creative. I think they can do, you know, do all sorts of stuff. I lived in I lived in in uh, Uganda uh, for a year, and in Luganda, there the it's it's a there are ten noun classes, and the ten noun classes all have to be in agreement. And um, although pronouns are non-gendered, um, every single verb, adjective, and noun that goes with like a man is gendered. And, and so there wasn't a way of, of redoing the language in this particular way. And so people just actually started choosing other noun classes. In, in Luganda, you know, there's noun classes for like uncountable, you know, like water is an uncountable noun class. Uh, and, and so people, uh, they call themselves kuchu, which is a Ugandan word for sort of queer, but doesn't mean quite the same thing. So the kuchus might conjugate 
because every single word needs to be conjugated, they might conjugate everything in uncountable. They might conjugate it in, I don't even remember all of the different noun classes, but the point is they found something that is extant in language that fit their culture that wasn't just like backwardsly, re, backwardsly or backward reconstruction or reverse engineering what uh, Americans have done or what Ang Anglophone, Anglophones have done. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that there's something hegemonic in the idea that the only way to make language fit trans people is to, is to do whatever English speakers have done. I, I think I'm excited to see what speakers of all these different languages do to in terms of this challenge. Yeah, yeah. I, it's, <clears throat> it's, 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 it's a question of creativity and I suppose flexibility. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, so much I can- I mean, <laughs> And some people, they may choose to redo the language and that's totally fine. Like I also have no problem with like lots of, I don't care, like language is flexible. We mm. don't have like it in French, we don't have that board. What's that French board that says what is okay and not oh, okay? The, uh, I think the um, Academy Francaise, yeah. Yeah, we don't have that in English, but uh, you know, neither, <laughs> if if people want to, if people want to emulate what happens in English, great, but I certainly don't think it's the only way. Mm -mm -mm. And actually I was, I was kind of reading about this today, but um, there is hope kind of within the trans uh, French community that because the Academy Française has allowed in kind of English words like le weekend, for example, or yeah. um, la COVID, <laughs> um, there is hope that there, you know, that this kind of um, inclusive language will kind of take hold. But I guess what was really striking, and this is the final thing I'll say, and then we really have to <laughs> wrap up, yeah. is that um, so there is, if you are interested and you're in France, there is. Um, a kind of uh, documentary, I would say, it's quite short, it's two seasons following the transition story um, of somebody called Ossia. Uh, mm. Have you heard about this story? I think so, but go on. Okay, yeah, and so it's, it's, it's kind of gotten a lot of publicity, but so um, Ossia uh, has now transitioned from uh, female to male and, and um, is kind of talking to many of the major kind of um, media outlets here. And I saw, him on France en Terre, which is really like the kind of BBC of France or like Good Morning America kind of. And it was striking to me that the journalist, she named, um, her name Sonia Delvier, I think. And she, it was the first time she'd heard of the phrase cisgender. And I was thinking that really, I mean, the kind of the, um, not the disconnect, but the, the disconnect in, t in terms of time, you know, the decalage between, uh, I suppose France and just using this language in America is is striking. I mean, you would not, I don't think, meet somebody at a kind of major news outlet in America who hadn't heard and used ever the phrase mm. cis. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But just just speaking about how this stuff is confused, I forgot what it is. The the root of of transgender, I think trans is Latin and cis is Greek. So even in the language itself. There's a confusion as to the origin of which uh, what what the etymology is. So the mm -hmm. opposite of trans probably shouldn't be a Greek yeah. prefix. Yeah. It should be a Latin prefix if you're doing it perfectly. But but it's my point is that actually who cares? <laughs> like the idea is the idea is that can you communicate the idea? And yeah. if it's a Greek root that is going to communicate the idea for you with cis or if it's a trans root that's going to communicate the idea yeah. i mean sorry a, a latin root whatever just do it and and that most of us have the building blocks to to communicate whatever we want and especially once they get standardized and accepted mm -mm -mm. okay like the, the word cisgender i don't care if they use it in france but the concept matters yeah. to me yeah yeah 